Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Center for International Policy Studies and the University of Ottawa. My name is Rita Abrahamson. I am the director of SIPS. Um, and I'm so delighted to see all of you here today for this talk that we are hosting in collaboration with the University Research Chair on Global Political Talk. Also, a very warm welcome to those of us who are not physically here, but joining us on Zoom. We think we have something like 37 people online, so that's pretty good. Um, we're going to begin, before I turn to today's event, which features these nice people sitting next to me here from the newly founded uh, Scottish Council on Global Affairs. Before I introduce them and introduce today's event, we're going to begin like we always do at SIPS, which is by acknowledging that we are still on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge their traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Today, uh, we are very pleased to uh, welcome the members of the newly founded Council on Scottish Council on Global Affairs. We hear a lot these days, I think, about the political turmoil in the UK. And only a few weeks ago, we hosted uh, Professor Richard Wynne Jones, who spoke about how Englishness is uh, transforming the British political landscape. I think in Scotland, um, this has particular consequences, but we don't hear a lot about it in Canada. So for that reason, we are particularly pleased to have um, my friends here with us. Uh, we posed them the question of uh, how does um, Scotland position itself in this rapidly changing geopolitical environment? How does Scotland position itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the UK, England, Wales? How does Scotland position itself vis-a-vis -vis Europe? And how does it position itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, including Canada? So to debate this, we have three members of the council, uh, which I will now introduce to you fairly briefly, because as always at SIPS, we have such distinguished guests that if I take all the time reading out their long bios, we won't hear much of what they have to say. So if you want to know more about them, please look it up on our website. I'm going to begin with Claire Duncanson uh, because I'm doing it in alphabetical order. Claire is a senior lecturer in international relations at the University of Edinburgh. Her research interests lie in the intersection of international security, IR theory and gender politics. And for those of you who are interested in gender politics in particular, I should mention at this point that uh, at two o'clock today, we have another talk at SIPS where Claire is also involved, which is on feminist foreign policy. And Rebecca Deason, who is here, is also at that panel. So you can spend the whole day with SIPS. It doesn't get <laughs> any better. Uh, I'm also reliably informed that Claire quite recently featured on the front page of the Times newspaper in the UK, relating to controversies about Scotland's announcement that they will be adopting a feminist foreign policy. So there's lots to discuss here. Next to Claire is Stephen Gethins. He is a professor in practice at the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews, so a bit further north in Scotland. Um, he is the author of Nation to Nation, Scotland's Foreign Policy Footprint. Um, he previously served as an MP for North East Five and was the SNP's International Affairs and Europe spokes spokesperson in Parliament. And he was particularly focused on Brexit, on the run-up and the aftermath of the EU referendum. So he shall have lots of interesting insights to uh, share with us, I'm sure. Last but not least, Peter Jackson is the executive director of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs, and he is also the chair of global security at the University of Glasgow. Peter's area of specialization includes international history of the 19th and 20th century, the use of history in the formulation of foreign and defense policy, and the role of intelligence in policymaking from both historical and contemporary perspectives. And like 
Our other two guests today, Peter has a long list of publications of books and articles, and we are at the moment really looking forward to his forthcoming book, which is called Peacemaking in International Order After the First World War. So that's enough from me. As you can tell, there's three really interesting people, three really interesting perspectives. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Peter. Peter, the floor is yours. You may want to use the microphone primarily for those who are joining us online. I think otherwise we can hear okay, but um, to make it easier for those who are. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a real special treat for me to, to be here. Uh, je suis très content, très honoré, et très reconnaissant d'être ici présenter nos projets à vous. Uh, it's especially cool because uh, Rita is an old colleague and a yes. friend. Not, you're not old. We just <laughs> are, we're colleagues. And I have other colleagues from various stages in my career, from uh, basketball at the University of Cambridge to the Department of International Relations, politics rather, at Aberystwyth University. So it's lovely to be here. And I'm especially pleased that Russell Green can join us online. Hello, Russell, wherever you are. Uh, thanks so much. I think I'm going to take my time, if that's okay, to present the concept of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs to all of you. I was uh, doing a radio interview not long ago by for BBC Scotland, and the radio interviewer asked me, so why does Scotland need uh, council on Global Affairs, you know, aren't these aren't there councils in London that are doing this job uh, and doing it for a long time? Why would anybody listen to me? <laughs> this is a serious point. And I asked them, well, is it because people in Scotland are stupid and don't understand international politics? Is it because you think I'm stupid, which <laughs> might have more grounds in, in, in reality or not? But it's a, it's, a, it's in a way it's a it's a strange environment in Scotland to uh, be launching an initiative like this because Scotland is a very divided country over the question of whether it should have its own foreign policy or not. This foreign policy under the UK Constitution, which only exists, uh, it doesn't exist anywhere in writing, uh, is a reserved area. Well, it does, that, that part does exist in ways. And yet, there's an awful lot of expertise in Scotland. And there's an awful lot of uh, research talent. There's an awful lot of interest and appetite to learn about global affairs. And so our idea during, during the pandemic was that this might be a good moment to lay the groundwork and the foundations for uh, something which is in between a classic think tank and a more academic research institute, whereby we would uh, pursue three aims, really. The first would be to, to create a hub around which to marshal expertise in global affairs, broadly defined in Scotland, and put it at the, uh, at the disposal of public policymaking in Edinburgh, in London, and beyond. Yeah. The second uh, aim is to provide a forum for evidence-based discussion and debate and public engagement in Scotland over key questions like, for example, the relationship between the UK and the EU, the relationship between Scotland and the EU, and even possibly the relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And Scotland, it has to be said, and I I don't think I have uh, a kind of starry-eyed idealism about the intellectual and public climate there. The kind of reaction to experts that was one of the lamentable characteristics of the debate uh, about leaving the EU within the UK, that's never been a, a strong current in Scotland. There is, I think, I think it's fair to say, uh, a greater appreciation for ideas and debate in Scotland than I found, for example, when I lived in England, or when, uh, along with the 
several colleagues here. I spent a good decade and 12 years of my life in, in Aberystwyth, in Wales. Uh, I don't know why that might be the case. There's a lot of, Scotland has a lot of universities, small country. And uh, in any case, so our idea is to provide a nonpartisan forum for evidence based debate. Uh, and the third aim is to provide a network to link up researchers and experts and people who are interested in global affairs within Scotland with the rest of the world, especially, I suppose, in some ways, ways professional researchers, whether it's from the third sector or from universities. So those are the three aims. And there is no such institution like that in Scotland. There is a place called Chatham House in London, which many of you, I think, will, will uh, of which will, many of you will be aware. And there's the Royal United Services Institute, and there are a number of other think tanks down in London, but there's nothing in Scotland. It's like the fact that there are nine universities in Scotland with international relations. Yeah, and so this was our idea. There's a lot of expertise. Uh, and at first, I hesitated to do this because yeah. really I'm an historian. I'd rather be working in the archives than being out in public. But I thought it was a chance for me to make a small contribution to what's going on in Scotland. And my my boss, the principal of Glasgow, man named Anthony Shelley, can be pretty persuasive. And he said to me, when people talk about independence in Scotland, it's always a debate about whether or not we're going to be 500 or 1,000 pounds better or worse off in five or 10 years, rather than the institution that a small country like Scotland might need if it were to become independent. And that wasn't all that persuasive to me because I'm not really a big support campaigner, at least for Scottish independence. And he said, and this is something Scotland needs whether or not, uh, uh, you know, there is a debate for, for independence. So we managed to begin with a partnership between three universities, Glasgow, St. Andrews in Edinburgh, and we managed to get cross-party support, which is quite amazing, and a real education for a Canadian living in Scotland about the tribal nature of Scottish politics in some, some quarters, and I'm happy to elaborate on that later, if no other no, no Scottish Labour supporters in the room. Uh, but really, it was as if we were pushing on an open door in a lot of ways. And the support was easy. We were given a hard time because of what in Scotland is called the constitutional question, that of whether Scotland should be independent or not. And Trotsky, Leon Trotsky once said about war, he said, you may not be, no, he said it about history, forgive me. You may not be interested in history, but history is interested in you. And for me in Scotland, it was, you may not be interested in the constitutional question. So the constitutional question is interesting to you. And so it was, it, we had to convince all of the unionist uh, key people that we were not going to be an organ to promote independence. Far from it, that we were going to be absolutely nonpartisan and protect our integrity and credibility by uh, not taking an institutional position on that question. We have other partners as well. Uh, the Scottish government is a strong supporter of us. We also get support from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, financial support. We get moral support, I guess, from the Scottish office, Scotland office. No, but, but that is very important to us, to have support both from Westminster and the Westminster government and from the Scottish government, not least because it can be handy playing one off against the other and, and, and in a constant search for more financial support. We also have third sector uh, uh, relationships which are growing and emerging. Very good one with the consular war 
in Edinburgh, very interesting people, see Edinburgh Consular Corps and a lot of uh, senior diplomats pass through Edinburgh, the Scottish Whiskey Association, Amnesty International, the Scottish Refugee Council, uh, the Scottish Development uh, Association. And so what we're able to do is reach into the third sector, reach into the private sector, and try and build a base with, with which to, to continue uh, growing. And really, our aim, very briefly, finally, we have uh, identified six general themes that we thought were probably most important for us to promote with the limited financial work we have in terms of, of uh, uh, research support. And the first is rights, uh, migration, refugee, uh, refugee policy, that's one. The second is foreign policy, probably more classic area of interest, but nonetheless, absolutely vital. And the third is global governance, international law, international trade, uh, international organizations, general institutions. The fourth is environment and energy policy, climate, the degradation of the climate and its political ramifications. Uh, the fifth is probably closer to my own area, which is hard security, defense, and intelligence, and especially given that Scotland has a unique position and geopolitical position as part of the UK into the high north. I don't say Arctic when I'm in Canada because Indians can give it from the Arctic. So it's, it's true. Uh, and the final one is global public health, which is absolutely on everyone's mind when we began this in late 2020. And since then, as I suppose declined in, in terms of its imminence, its uh, immediacy, but nonetheless. And in particular, we've identified two areas that we're devoting uh, much of our energy and financial resources to. And the first is the changing security architecture in Europe, as a result of the Ukraine war and the advent of Sweden and Finland, NATO, as well as what the uh, war in Ukraine is going to mean, especially for. European political order, but international political order as well. And the second is foreign policy, what it means and what it has to offer. And that is where I can I'll pass over to Claire. She's one of the well, experts on this. I don't think she's going to be speaking entirely of this. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I've been to Ottawa and uh, really it's a great honour to come and uh, to just share some thoughts with you all under this heading of uh, Scotland in a changing world order. Um, Scotland is a fascinating case to study. I mean, I'm a, a little bit biased, but um, and as Peter said, it's not that the SCG is set up just to look at Scotland, but that is um, what we thought we would focus on today. So Scotland endeavours in the world to be a good global citizen. So I thought I would just share some thoughts about, about that project today. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a challenging project, I think, and maybe like all projects of that nature, um, it is perhaps um, a story of, of contradictions and tensions and dilemmas as much as a straightforward story of success. So I'll just talk a little bit about what, what the Scottish government means when it says it wants to be a good global citizen. Um, outline some of those challenges and, and dilemmas and, the, and, and do that focusing really on three main areas. So one is around its efforts to be something of a peace broker, a champion of human rights and the rule of law. The other is to be a leader in international climate justice. And the third, picking up on what Peter said, this champion of gender equality and um, both at home and abroad, the feminist foreign policy. 
So in terms of what it means um, to be a good global citizen, the Scottish Government talks about making a constructive contribution to addressing global challenges. It talks about the creation of good green jobs at home and, and overseas, reducing poverty with a particular focus on child poverty, um, and uh, also tackling inequalities with, with a focus on gender inequality. Again, this is both kind of from domestic and overseas agendas. So trying to be, trying to have that policy coherence. Um, talks about European values and internationalism, prioritizing international development and climate justice, speaks a lot about the values of fairness and equity. And interestingly, I think always mentions the kind of recognition of the um, historical privilege that Scotland and Scottish people hold by virtue of having benefited from empire and slavery, the legacies of colonialism. So it's an ambitious, progressive, quite exciting agenda, but there are constraints obviously for Scotland. It's a relatively small country, population of about 5.5 million. It's a, it's a sub-state, as you all know, so it doesn't have the full levers of power that a, that a state would. It operates, you might say, in something of a hostile context in the sense of, and Stephen's going to talk more about this, in the sense of having been taken out of the European Union against the majority of the Scottish people's wishes. Um, and being part of a UK state, the current UK government being perhaps um, the most right wing that we've seen, um, I would say, ever. So, um, so there's so it makes so there's those constraints in terms of of and as Peter mentioned, uh, a UK government that that's not necessarily comfortable with Scotland carving out a role for itself on the world stage. So, how in those kinds of contexts does it um, can it be a good global citizen? And that's not even to mention, I suppose, the biggest constraint, I think, this we're in a world of poly crises, as everyone's talking about, you know, we have the war in Ukraine, um, which is distracting us, but shouldn't from the fact that we've got wars ongoing in many, many other places. So uh, um, increasingly violent world and the threat of nuclear war, I think, rising back up the agenda. There's the E ecological crises, so not just climate change. Um, and I think, you know, unless we see something special emerge from, from COP at the moment, we're on track for global warming of 2.7 degrees, so not in a good place. Alongside the other ecological crises of biodiversity collapse, where we're, we're at risk of, I think, maybe having lost 1 million species. We've the pandemic already been mentioned. Um, and I suppose the, the pandemic has really exacerbated the inequalities crisis. Um, it's said that through the pandemic, the wealth of the, 10, the world's 10 richest men um, doubled, but 99% of the population are worse off in terms of income. So we've had this exacerbation of inequalities um, because of the pandemic and also perhaps, um, as many have said, a recognition that the, the Coronavirus is just one of, um, of the many crises we're going to face because of the way we've encroached, that humanity has encroached on nature. So in that kind of world of poly crises, how does a small sub-state be a good global citizen? It's quite the challenge. So just as I said, I would talk about efforts to be a, a peace broker um, and a champion of the rule of law and human rights. So there's... Um, it's interesting here, you might really point to the constraints on Scotland. What can it do as a, such a small and a sub-state actor? But here, a lot of people point to the way in which um, maybe some of those constraints are also opportunities for Scotland. It's not seen as such a powerful player, and that might give it space to manoeuvre. So it can, um, it's seen as not having so much skin in the game, perhaps, so can act as a, a mediator, invite uh, conflicting parties to, to come to Scotland, to to negotiate and, and there's a track record of it doing that. Um, but I suppose at the same time, Scotland, Scottish government needs to reckon with the fact that we have an arms industry. So this is something that's really afflicted every state that's tried to, to claim to have a feminist foreign policy. We have a thriving arms industry and is that compatible with being a good global citizen? We also host the UK's nuclear weapons. Um, 
because really we're it's the the deep waters in the west coast of Scotland is the only place where the nuclear submarines would be able to um, be located. So that's a huge question for the Scottish government as well. How could it be a good global citizen? Um, the Scottish government is opposed to nuclear weapons, so this will be a really live question of independence happens. Um, also, perhaps, how does Scotland be a good global citizen when the world doesn't seem to want peace? We're seeing an escalation of the crisis in Ukraine. Um, it's called for, you know, the rule of law. It's played a very positive role, I think, in terms of hosting refugees, but, but could it do more to be a peace broker? And again, that will be a, a question that comes with more tensions and challenges if Scotland becomes independent, because it, the, the SNP, the ruling party, has historically been opposed to joining NATO, but that's changed over the last sort of like 10 years ago. And um, the SNP are now committed to joining NATO. The Greens, who are their partner in government, are opposed to joining NATO. So there's really challenging questions there for Scotland going forward about does it join NATO? Do we can we think of NATO as a peace broker or is it part of the problem in Ukraine? So interesting debates to be had there. Has the international community and could Scotland do more to push the international community to explore further some of the non-military um, ways that it could intervene in, in Ukraine? Did we explore all options to support anti-war um, movements within Russia? Did we explore all options to try and tackle oligarchs well? There's quite a lot of evidence that um, in part because of interest in the rich West, not wanting there to be, for example, a global financial registry. We didn't do all we could to tackle, to try these non-military means of ta uh, tackling Putin. So interesting dilemmas ahead. In terms of international climate justice, again, lots of opportunity for the Scottish government and a fairly good track record in terms of being a international climate justice leader. It has set quite strong targets. So it's set itself the challenge of um, net zero carbon emissions by 2045. That's five years ahead of the rest of the UK and I think Canada and lots of other states. It's, it was the first country to contribute funding to loss and damage. So um, recognition that some countries, particularly in the global south, have um, already suffered so much from climate crisis it's not, it's kind of beyond adaptation or amelioration. Um, and when Nicola Sturgeon announced the funding, our first minister for loss and damage, she was very clear that this wasn't an act of charity, but an act of reparation in recognition of the fact that it's rich countries in the global north that as the historical emitters have done so much to drive climate change that is hitting those that have done least amount to cause it hardest and worst. It's, it's been quite effective at, at kind of joining, trying to ally with other small states and small sub-states to, um, to raise advocacy for climate justice. And it's, and it's um, I guess, made a lot of its potential to be a, a leader in terms of a just transition at home, away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Scotland's got tons of potential when it comes to renewable energy, maybe less in terms of solar, as you might know if you visited us, but certainly with wind and wave, huge potential. So there was talk of, um, you know, being the Saudi Arabia of renewables and a real, uh, yeah, potential to, um, to bring about this just transition, which is about ensuring that in any transition from fossil fuels to renewables, that people that have worked in, the, in oil and gas and other polluting industries aren't made to pay the price for that. So learning the lessons of our deindustrialization that happened in the 1980s, and making sure that taking advantage of the fact that most of people who work in oil and gas have a brilliant skill set that is completely um, appropriate for the, the green te um, technologies needed in this, in this transition. Um, so it's exciting things. However, Scotland has quite often missed its impressive climate targets. Um, so, and you might say that the target of net zero by 2045 is not enough. So there's questions to be raised there. Um, there is also the fact that this funding for this climate finance for loss and damage is a drop in the ocean of what's required. If we think about Pakistan, a third of the country underwater, so on, so forth. I suppose there's a fundamental issue around 
to be a leader in climate justice, we need to seriously be talking about transforming our economic system. And that's something that is both kind of commonplace and massively controversial. I think it's commonplace in the sense that you see um, the IPCC reports, you see the UN, you see all global scientists saying this with you know, increasing urgency and, and um, at volume that we need to be talking about transforming our economic system away from a kind of extraction, pollute, use up, discard model to more circular, regenerative economies. At the same time, it's kind of controversial to say that because everyday media, everyday policy making goes on as if that isn't the case. We still kind of measure our success in terms of GDP growth. So there's this kind of thing going on there. Scotland is rather a bundle of contradictions. It is officially a champion of a well-being economy, and it does tons to suggest that it has grasped that we need to be transforming away from economic growth to different economic models. At the same time, it hasn't really, it's kind of like well-being and uh, sustainable development are add-ons to the traditional economic growth model rather than replacements. There's more I can say about that, but I'll just um, realize I'm talking too much, so I can, I'll come back to that. I suppose also there's a certain contradiction around its just transition proposal in the sense that, as I say, really exciting stuff going on in terms of ensuring that there's going to be really good quality jobs in the green sector. But there's quite a lot of commentary to suggest that when we talk about the just transition, we need to broaden our understanding of justice and also broaden our understanding of transition. So what I mean by that is it, justice can't just be about making sure that people that were employed in oil and gas are employed in, in, in good jobs in green tech. It also needs to be about ensuring that people that were excluded from these well-paid jobs, women and marginalized groups, are also included in this in this um, in the new green jobs, and that also might mean uh, recognizing, rewarding, investing in those sectors that were already relatively green, but completely undervalued, i.e., the care sector. And I mean care broadly defined: education, health, social care, um, where women dominate. So broaden that conception of justice, and also if if. To be a good global citizen, we need to consider the impact of transitioning to renewables on the most marginalized in the global south. As we transition to um, away from fossil fuels, the need for high value minerals, lithium, cobalt, and so on, for batteries, for all sorts of renewable technology, has massive devastating impact, particularly on women in the global south. So we need to broaden our transition of, broaden our concept of transition. It's not just from fossil fuels to renewables we need, it's also tackling this model of extract, uh, pollute, discard to this regenerative model. So, so real challenges ahead, I think, to be a champion of climate justice. And then finally, Scotland as a champion of gender equality. Again, some great stuff, both home and abroad. Um, this development of a feminist foreign policy is really exciting and we've so much to learn from the Canadian experience of, of um, similar endeavours. Scotland has um, a gener generous climate justice fund that's really got equalities at the heart of it, including gender equality. It supported women peace builders with this um, a special fellowship, so women building peace in different difficult contexts around the world invited to Scotland to share best practices, to network, to, um, to receive training in ways that have been quite successful. Lots of supporting to ensure women are represented at highest levels of climate negotiations. So the Scottish government's doing loads of good things. However, there's always, there's always a but. Um, there's a sense in which we need to remember feminism isn't just the participation of women. It isn't just gender equality. It isn't just women's empowerment. Feminism, for most of us, is about challenging the structures that drove those exclusions, that drove those um, violations of women's human rights, that drove those inequalities, including gender inequalities. And so it's about transforming, as I've already said, the, the extractivist economic system. It's about transforming the militaristic um, international relations system. And there's an open question, I think, about the extent to which a uh, Scottish government has grasped that element of being a good global citizen. And so I suppose I'd conclude by saying that's not really a critique of the Scottish government so much as a, a, a really a 
kind of a comment on the challenge I think we all face. Like, how can any state, no matter a small sub-state, but how can any state try to trans to to tackle these structures that drive inequalities in a world where states perhaps have less power than some uh, financial and corporate interests? So, so that would be my takeaway from the trying to watch Scotland navigate its way to be a good global citizen. <laughs> thanks there i'm just taking that now um first of all thank you so much Rita, everybody else for, for having us along it's such a pleasure to be here today um i think this is a number of firsts as peter said well certainly for claire and i first time in ottawa first time school is doing something in canada um given the themes that, that we've explored so far so as peter um suggested earlier on we draw from fantastic expertise in scotland so we've we've fantastic experts on what does the future of European security look like? What does the High North and our engagement with that look like? What's a feminist foreign policy look like? Um, and we're really lucky at the Scottish Council and in Scotland as a whole to have so many experts from around the world. Peter's one of them that we've been able to get him from Canada and keep him. Um, but also I think given the nature of the Scottish Council, this is actually the first time that we've got a majority Scottish panel <laughs> on anything that we've done as, 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 as well, which is really nice, which is really something that I appreciate. And I think sums up the, the, the way that in Scotland, um, and Peter highlighted this and we're and Claire and I I'm sure agree, we're, we're so lucky to have people from around the world who contribute to our higher education sector. And it's really nice to be having this discussion with you today. Um, this is also, I think, the first time we've looked at Scotland. So we look at these themes as a whole, but we don't so much look at Scotland sometimes. And actually, our foreign policy and our place in the world is having, like other parts of the world, is having such a huge impact on what will happen to Scotland as a country and how we see ourselves in the world. This isn't new. Now, I'm not a historian, and I'm about to horrify all the historians here, but I'm not a historian, but I think it's always useful to look at history and, and, and talk about, look, our place in the world has always influenced us. So to horrify the historians um, in the room, I'm going to start with Braveheart, um, if anybody's watched it. So in the film Braveheart, um, if anybody's watched it, you'll see it's a film about William Wallace. Um, but what's really interesting is the one historical document that we do have in real life of William Wallace is, is called the Letter of Lubeck. And when Scotland re-established its independence back in 1297, um, the only letter that we have in William Wallace is, um, he, he was a guy who sort of re-established independence, he was in the film, but he wrote the letter of Lubeck, which was a letter to the Hanseatic League, which was the EU of its day saying Scotland's open for business again. And now, what's at the very heart of our debate and discussion about Scotland's future is our relationship with our European partners. And I just find it really interesting. I don't think countries should look back, it should look forward, but I just find it really interesting that given that there's so much in history that you can learn from that informs um, your present as well. Um, Scotland's foreign policy has been at the heart of the way we've evolved when Scotland signed the Treaty of Union in 1707, a treaty critically um, between um, sovereign states. Um, that was done in part, in part, there are many areas to this, because Scotland's failed foreign policy venture in the Darien, what is now Panama, to establish a colony. Scotland, Scots were involved in colon, colonizing other parts of the world before um, they were part of the United Kingdom um, and subsequently played a role in empire. And we've got, we're so fortunate to have a diaspora spread throughout the world, including here, a, a great diaspora. But, you know, I was listening to Rita earlier on and her words about the Algonquin people here, and that's been replicated, you know, so as well as having the clearances in Scotland, Scots displaced people across the world. So I think that if a country is to talk about its future, you need to be honest about your past and how you got there. And I was really struck by your opening remarks today, Rita. Um, and I thought that was such a touching way and a good way for us to begin our discussions and a pertinent way to begin our discussions. And I'll fast forward to the present day. And as Peter set out, um, Scotland's at a bit of a crossroads. Now, my background is that I'm somebody who's a pro-independence member of parliament. I'll try and be as balanced as I possibly can um, because there are many good people who are contributing to this venture, contributing this debate, regardless of their thoughts on the constitution. And we're really lucky to have support from every political party in Scotland and from both governments, the Scottish government and the UK government. But there's no question that Scotland's future is up, up in the air as a result of the Brexit referendum. 
Now, I'm going to give you a couple of stats. Um, in 2014, um, 2000, so when the independence referendum was in 2014, and you had the referendum at UK level in 2016. On the run into the 2016 referendum, there was something like 45% of those who had voted yes in the independence referendum for independence would go on to vote remain. About 44% of the population who had voted um, had, had voted yes would go on to vote leave. So there was no discernible difference in 2014 between people who are in favour of the European Union or not. If you fast forward to now, the latest polling data that we have is that 65% of those who voted remain would now vote for independence. 22% of those who voted leave would now vote for independence. So Brexit, and I, I hope I'm being as dispassionate as I can as somebody who passionately believes in the European project, um, is my personal view. Brexit's driving this. So our place in the world is again sitting at the heart of our domestic politics. And this leaves really significant challenges um, that, that I hope we can start to explore today. So if you're if you're in favor of the union, for example, so let's put cards on the table, we're talking about Scotland's future. If you're in favor of the union, then how do you switch back on the the big difference as well, apart from leave remain is one of age. So again, the polling data shows that about two thirds of under 55s are in favor of independence. So the big difference is not one of geography, educational attainment, income, all these other things that we divide people up into, into categories, but it's one of age. So if you're the United Kingdom, how do you switch back on the parts of the population who are your future, who no longer identify with the state for which they carry a passport? Now, that is a challenge um, that any sensible politician will think about. Um, how do you recognise Scotland's place in the world? And if you look at the role that sub-state actors, clear identified sub-state actors play throughout the world, it can be quite significant. And I noted, and I, I will make no comment on Canadian politics, I merely observe that when Canada, I used to work in the European Union, when Canada signed the CETA agreement and with the European Union, really big deal, big trade deal. I don't want to get into the the politics of it, I merely observed that I think the 16 provinces in Canada were part of that negotiation team in a way that would not happen for Scotland within the United Kingdom. Your near neighbours, um, and I study the dispute that you have with them in, in, in the book that I wrote in Scotland's foreign policy in Denmark, your great rivals, um, they're really interesting in the way that they engage with Faroe Islands and Greenland in terms of their foreign policy footprints. In fact, the front page of the Danish foreign ministry um, website sets out the areas where the Faroese or the Greenlandic can have that um, foreign policy footprint. So if you look elsewhere, there are um, areas where sub-state actors can have a role within the state and that allows them to have that identity. And also what's foreign policy about? It's about improving the lives of your citizens, really. And if you look at the big challenges nowadays, what's the big challenge in UK politics? Regardless, and I think everybody would agree on this, and I'm sure in Canadian politics, cost of living crisis. The chap doors you ask people, that is driven by our foreign policy, it's driven by our place in the world. And what about those who are in favour of independence? Well, if you're in favour of independence, you're asking people in Scotland to put quite a lot of trust in you, especially in an uncertain world. You're saying this is it's a big step here. Um, and so you need to have answers around what does EU membership look like? What's it look like in terms of the way that you govern yourselves? The idea of sovereignty, remember the idea of parliamentary sovereignty is different in Scotland and England, historically. Um, the idea of parliamentary sovereignty that was part of the Brexit project does not exist in Scots law, for instance. But how does that look within the European Union? What do you give up? What do you compromise on? What do you prioritize? Because you can't have everything and you need to prioritize, but especially as a smaller actor, um, how does it look in terms of your priority, your priorities? And I think the Scottish government, I think Claire set this out very well, climate, um, areas of conflict and some of the Scottish government's work around the areas that Claire set out and also among 1325 sort of women peacemakers has been quite striking. First Minister's in Sharm El Sheikh at the moment um, for, for COP, um, just giving a distinctly Scottish voice to some of these questions, but also, what about other big issues? 
How do you tackle the cost of living crisis? How do you make that just transition that people want to see? What's your war in Ukraine mean? And actually, in the war in Ukraine, um, there were failures in every political party in the UK around areas of Cliff highlighted finance, dirty money going through the London financial markets from Russia. There were failures in terms of disinformation and how we engage with productive debate around some of these issues. And also for the fact that countries in Europe are taking their security pretty seriously at the moment. If you're one of our partners in the Baltic states or Nordic states, our neighbours, because remember Scotland's neighbours in the Baltics and the Nordics, they have an existential threat. Not a threat that they debate and discuss, an existential threat. And one which, you know, you've got Lithuanian politicians who were born in gulags because of the threat from their neighbours at the moment. So the war in Ukraine poses some really serious questions and we failed. We failed on disinformation, finance. Russia hosted the World Cup, for goodness sake, in 2018. Not that that ever bothers Scotland because we, um, <laughs> we, 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 we preemptively failed to qualify for entirely moral reasons. We did the same with Qatar as yeah, well. Yeah, very good. yeah so very that's good a lesson for you Canadians out there, good global <laughs> citizens. But these are all areas that Scotland really needs to think about inside or outside the union. And just finally, Brexit changes everything and we need to reflect on what our relationship looks like with the other parts, our nearest neighbours within um, those islands as well. So regardless of our future, our place in the world and how we interact with others is going to have a really significant impact on our citizens, and also um, on citizens elsewhere. And that's something that we increasingly need to reflect on. But Rita, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all, that was really interesting. We have time for questions, comments, answers. Um, Matthias, we're going to use the microphone, right? So because of the people who are with us, Virtually, we will uh, use the microphone for, for questions and also for the answers. Uh, may I ask you please to keep your questions, um, you know, they don't have to be like super short, but refrain from long lectures. Please also um, introduce yourselves uh, when you ask the question. Mateus here, who is our eminent helper, is going to come and I will instruct him not to give away the microphone. He will hang on to it um, because I have learned this, that sometimes we never get it back. So, <laughs> so uh, the microphone is now on, Matthias. Uh, you can start here with Peter. Hi, Peter Hinshaw. Um, for the last 20 years, uh, Africa analyst in the government of Canada. Um, the Africa story is super interesting in relation to Quebec foreign policy. And I think there's quite a lot to be learned um, by looking over the history of Quebec's engagement internationally. Um, in, in Africa, for example, the thing that propelled Canadian national government into engagement with post-independence Francophone West Africa was really Quebec. Quebec got in first and the national government said, oh my God, we can't let them loose here. So I think you shouldn't underestimate the power of a subnational state when it comes to foreign policy, because you can, the tail can wag the dog. Um, and similarly, I have worked on secondment in, in New Zealand, and New Zealanders always sort of laugh at Canadians when the Canadians say, we're a small power. And they say, no, you're not. <laughs> um, don't underestimate the power of a small foreign policy, taking a country, taking a principled stand and getting engaged in ways that other countries aren't. We're going to take two questions at a time to give you uh, this right. Hello, I'm uh, Jane Parpard, and I'm going to actually ask a question in a way that is one that Tim Shaw, my husband, who's at home uh, ill, um, would want to ask, I think, which is basically the issue about Ireland. It's, the, I, I was at an meeting and I said, you know, Ireland is actually uh, the richest country in Europe, in the EU. And, and the people in the room say, ah, it can't be true, but it is true, it's absolutely true. So that if, if we're right, and Ireland is, as has as much wealth and potential, not Northern Ireland, but all the rest of Ireland, then there, there is a possibility that Scotland could 
work out some interesting relationships with uh, Ireland that would give them a unique position in relation to the rest of the EU. So I think that's something that really needs to be looked into. Yeah, okay. So look, I'll I'll take a pop first. Um, Peter, I think your story about Quebec's really interesting. And again, I don't want to, I'm hesitant to get involved and make any comment on Canadian politics at all, but this idea of brand and the role that sub-state actors can play is a really significant one. And I think it's actually quite underdeveloped in Scotland, um, which is why, forgive me, I wrote this book, Nation to Nation, Scotland <laughs> Foreign, <laughs> Foreign Policy Footprint. Um, but what's, what's been really good about opening up the debate, so I, I interviewed politicians from North America, including Canada, from the United States, including people in the White House from across Europe, but actually the most interesting conversations I had were with friends and colleagues in different political parties in, in the UK, including very passionate people at the Union. Scotland, given its brand, um, given, and we've got John and the team here from the Scottish Government to do a fantastic job working with colleagues in the British High Commission as well, I think it's fair to say. I think that in the UK as a whole, we need to mature our debate and discussion on this. You know, if regardless of if you're the Scottish Government with quite a small resource or New Zealand, or you're the UK or the US, you're competing in quite a crowded market. So you need to see what, what you're good at, how can you engage in the countries in which you're operating. And Scotland's got a distinctive role to play. And actually, yes, one thing I looked at was look at sub-state actors elsewhere, including Quebec, and you can learn from them. You know, you can't compare them directly, but there's a lot to be learned. So I think we need to develop that debate. You would be surprised to hear me say it. Jane, um, and hi to Tim. Um, <laughs> Ireland is thriving. I think it's really interesting the way Ireland's evolved. What's what's interesting in a number of ways. Um, I spoke speak to a lot of Irish politicians regularly. Um, a lot of them will say Ireland never truly became independent until it joined the EU, which I think gives you a particular perspective as a smaller European country, I'd say medium size actually in European terms, how we see sovereignty. You know, you speak to the Finns, or you speak to the Baltics, they see European Union membership as something that strengthens their independence, strengthens their sovereignty. And that's a very different way of looking at things. It's a way of looking at it from a very multilateral perspective, um, something which I think is probably more common in Canada. That's not the way that Westminster sees things at, at the moment, which of course is that move away. And one of the great divides between the way Scotland sees itself in the world and from a UK perspective, as I see it, and people have different views, is that idea of embracing multilateralism. Um, and what that means, it means compromise, it means you don't get everything your own way. I, I, I think Brexit is an incredibly unilateralist pursuit, um, and that gives a different perspective as well. But finally, what I find really interesting is despite what, what happened in the UK and its bigger neighbour, I think support for Ireland leaving the EU is about 7 or 8% now. You're kind of in flat air for Elvis lives in the moon kind of territory on that. But how much of a minority pursuit that's become. And I think the perspectives are really interesting there. Yes. But Ireland's an interesting example in, in other ways. And I, I sometimes wonder and worry about it held up as an example of what Scotland would become if if uh, it voted for independence, because on the one hand, like Ireland, and even more so, I think Scotland has a very a very highly developed, mature banking system, has a lot of national infrastructure, potential in research and development in terms of all the universities in Scotland. But there is also the question of the border between Scotland and England, and the fact that depending on who you ask and how it's calculated, between 62 and 69% of Scottish trade is with the rest of the UK across that border mainly. And the, the turbulence that would, would uh, emerge if, you know, Scotland made an application to join the single market after becoming independent, which mean that there's a hard border along the frontier between Scotland and England. I mean, if leaving the EU has been a nightmare for the United Kingdom, and it has been, that's a 45-year-old union. This is a 300-year-old union. So the negotiations would be complex in ways that are difficult to imagine. 
And I'm not, not saying I'm against independence. I'm just saying that these are realities that need to be taken into account. Thank you. Ed, if you want to add anything, or shall we take down plenty more questions? Yes, I've got a big more. Excellent. So, Brian, and then you next. Uh, Brian Schmidt, Carleton University. Uh, thank you very, very much for this. Really, really interesting. Um, I guess my question is mostly to Claire. So, I mean, notwithstanding that Canada is a state and Scotland is a sub-state, uh, the similarities that you drew uh, in terms of foreign policy were like very striking to me. It seems to me Canada also tries to do the three things that you said. And I would, uh, you know, I guess I'll show my realist card. I mean, uh, the idea of a good global citizen makes me very, very nervous because uh, it's inherently contradictory. Um, and so Canada allegedly does have a gender-based foreign policy. Um, but I had an undergraduate student write a paper who told me all about the arms deals that we have with Saudi Arabia. And one of the most lucrative buyers of our weapons is Saudi Arabia. So, you know, you just get into contradictions from the get-go. Um, and I, I guess my specific question, you know, you, you you mentioned a lot of constraints for Scotland to achieve these these lofty ideals, which are which are good. Um, but I was just thinking about another constraint, which is parallels here: domestic politics. Um, you know, there's this thing, elites versus the people, that is running all around the world. And I, I have an insider who reads parliamentary uh, debates every single day. And it says this disjuncture between people who are explaining that uh, constituents can't afford fuel, home heating oil, et cetera, et cetera. And then the response is, we are being a good global citizen on the environment. This is what we must do. Uh, and I, you know, not to project to the future, this could get us a very different government in the not too distant future. Thanks. Uh, my name is Andrew, Andrew Romain. Uh, I was in Scotland one time when I was young on a bicycle. From, I went from Dundee to Stranraer, as you know, those places, yeah. Um, my question, though, is, uh, is it a real question? Um, the other two places, well, Quebec, I'm from Quebec, and I live, I mean, I'm living there now. Uh, uh, there was no um, real changes there until the FLQ, the terrorist group in the 70s when I was young. I knew it well. Um, and in Ireland, the uh, Sinn Féin, I guess, uh, I mean, another terrorist group. And of course, we all know about it. But I've never heard about a terrorist group or, let's say, uh, freedom fighters in Scotland. Is there such a thing who are using violence or like the Sinn Féin or like the FLQ in Quebec? Yeah, that was the question. Are there any violent groups in Scotland? Let you answer those two questions, and then Matthias will take Alan here and anyone else afterwards. Two, uh, two at a time. I think they're pretty big, interesting questions. Yeah. Claire, to you first. Um, so I'll take the second one first. Um, not really. I mean, there was very isolated, Stephen might know more about the history, very, very isolated incidences. But one of the things that Scots talk about all the time is about how nationalism in Scotland is very different. It's not ethnic, it's a civic nationalism, and it's very, very peaceful. And one of the hallmarks of our 2014 independence debate was the was the was said to be the kind of flourishing of a peaceful, constructive conversation. It was really, and we were chatting about this earlier. Um, I'm I'm not so much an independent supporter, but I would definitely testify to that, like an absolute flourishing of really wonderful political debate where we're different, you know, it, maybe not overstate it, there were also fallouts, but it is um, an interesting case of where the, the struggle for self-rule has not been at all violent. It's been, um, it's been, yeah, a positive, uh, democratic, constructive endeavor in many ways. Um, then on to Brian's question. He, he, so yes, you said, um, I guess I would say two things. The, I guess you're faced with the, um, you can go two paths in the face of these 
contradictions. There will always be contradictions when a state tries to set itself up as this kind of good global citizen, trying to do good in, in a world where the world is constructed on, on states pursuing their national interests, a, wor a world of anarchy and so on. You can either, I guess, give up or try harder in a sense. And so I just look at the challenges we are facing and I'm just, I suppose, less likely to say, to put my realist hat on and say, states will always be hypocritical when they try to do this, so they shouldn't try. I would always fall on the side of, we have got to build a better world, especially those of us in positions of privilege in the global north. We have got to try harder to um, push our states to not just put national interest first. And that links to the second point, um, because I don't think it's as, um, it, as impossible as your question implies. There are so many good policies out there that can show citizens how you would both, for example, tackle the cost of living crisis and international climate crisis at the same time. So the policies around get the polluters to pay. And if you were to do that, so a recent report that's come out from Stop Climate Chaos Scotland is excellent on this. Um, you know, 100 pages of detailed policies, so it's not just your kind of um, wishful thinking, for how you could uh, finance a just transition by um, targeting those that have benefited, so the fossil fuel companies, manufacturers of um, medicines throughout the pandemic, other corporate actors, in order to achieve energy security in, in countries so that citizens aren't, are, aren't forced into that um, narrative where they have to either look after themselves, you know, we've got poverty here, we've got unemployment here, we've got drug addiction as the kind of things you would hear in Scotland, or we can look after those overseas. Actually, we could do both if we were to tap into the wealth of the 1%. We know that that's the case. It's, it's the fact that um, we don't, I think, the power of the 1% is, is such that it's, you know, very, very difficult to challenge. And we don't yet have governments who are, and media, who are, who are, um, who are really articulating that narrative, it, it seems to me. They are much more likely to make it seem like either or. You can either look after the marginalised at home or you could look after them overseas. That's not, it's not actually true. One Jeffin, do you want to add? We have more questions, but I'm, I'm happy to add to, to listen to yes. more questions and I can come back yeah. with a couple of short points. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks very much for this. My name is Alan Freeman. I'm an honorary senior fellow here at the uh, Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, I wanted to sort of try to flip some of your comments about progressive. Scottish views on things like climate and gender policy and European and globalist issues. And I ask you how you frame this within the English Scottish sphere. In other words, it seems to me that a lot of stuff gets still, I think, to Scots. Still, there's a lot of this English, there is English Scottish tension, whether it's whether it's uh, civil or not, right? Whether it's on the soccer pitch or ever, you know. So Scots say, see the UK, they love Margaret Thatcher. We hate Margaret Thatcher. You know, the, the English loved Boris Johnson. We hate Boris Johnson. You know, the, the English want to get out of the European Union. God damn it, we want to stay in the European Union. So to what extent, and the same would go to fund, you know, climate stuff, et cetera. To what extent is, is Scottish public opinion framed by the fact that they see themselves in opposition to what the English are? And that, you know, in an independent Scotland, it could be very different. I mean, is Scotland really willing to open up its doors to all immigrants and refugees on boats? I'm just asking a question. Or to what extent is that prism of uh, Scotland versus England part of public opinion in Scotland, particularly today? Ponder that while we take one more question. Uh, so there will be, we'll take two questions, Michael at the end. Yeah. 
the call now. If there are more people who want to get on the list, please raise your hand and I'll make a note and I'll come to it in, in a moment. But Michael, please. Thank you so much for this. Michael Williams from the Graduate School of uh, Public International Affairs. I, I hate to, to be the person who asks the cliched questions, but I have to ask very quickly to the two questions. And it involves basically where the debate is at in Scotland right now, if you could talk about it rather than an either or. The first is the question that, that I think came up a number of times, which is the question of the nuclear weapons. Could you talk a little bit about what the status of, of the debates over the nuclear submarines are at the moment? And the second is, what is this current thinking about the possibility of a secessionist state actually being admitted to the EU and the current ways in which the Scottish government or the Scottish debate thinks about its relationship or possible accession to the EU? Thanks. Um, who wants to go first on these two, three questions I think we have, maybe even four. Oh, okay, so on, sorry. Uh, the question of nuclear weapons is a really interesting one, partly because uh, they're at a naval base called Faslane, which is about 20, we drove by it once, 20 miles north of Glasgow. And uh, it's a very interesting, what, its role in the community is very interesting because there are permanent anti-nuclear demonstrators who live in camps outside as lane and then there are uh you know the personnel within the base and their kids go to the same schools and they see one another at the school gate and they're very civil and then uh when they're on their way to work they have to pass by these people who are living in camps demonstrating against them and the thing to remember i think in this is those demonstrators aren't a scottish phenomenon the UK CND movement, which is very still very strong. There's a lot of opposition to nuclear weapons in England, Wales, and, and Northern Ireland as well. They just happen to be in Scotland for the reasons Claire mentioned. And during the independence debate in of leading up to 2014, Malcolm Chalmers from the Royal United Services Institute led a study about the costs of decommissioning. It's in 19, in 2013, it was 14.6 billion pounds to move them to a place called Mil Milford Haven, which we, those of us who lived in Wales will, will know where that was. So it's the only place that's even remotely kind of compatible for deep water nuclear submarines. And this is a bit of a nightmare in some ways for uh, advocates of independence in Scotland because you know Scotland will need to be seen as a responsible security actor and therefore just demanding that the that Faz Lane is closed down immediately is not on the cards. But if you look at it in another way, that base is also a source of leverage for a Scottish government in terms of debates with the UK over independence, because it's so expensive, so vital, and uh, it's you know wrapped up at least in the minds of Brits. I've never been entirely convinced of this that nuclear weapons are part of Britain's claim to. P5 status on the Security Council. They're part of Britain's claim to be a global power. And so they're a problem on the one hand, because especially a lot of people, grassroots supporters of independence within the SNP are also very vehemently anti-nuclear. But on the other hand, you know, Scotland has this aspiration to be seen as a responsible European North Atlantic citizen. And so there are dilemmas there, but one way. I suppose, you know, and Stephen may know more about the internal debate. He will know more about internal debates in the SNP. But on one hand, it's kicking the can down the road. But on the other hand, it's a source of real leverage to have these weapons based in Scotland. And, you know, the process of removing them and just decommissioning them and moving them will be one where it will be very difficult for the UK government to take a really hard line in Scotland. Thanks. There's quite a lot to unpack there, Rita. So let me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do my best. On the, I'll take each question in turn. So I think Peter's right. Two questioners, but three questions. I think. Um, Alan, your question. I'm afraid I don't think people in Scotland nearly think about themselves in terms of what's going on in England. On the Brexit question, people in Scotland voted 62% to vote 
in the European Union. They voted on the same day as people in the rest of the UK. Um, public opinion, media opinion, common opinion was that the UK would vote to remain. Um, so I don't think they were voting to stay in the EU just because of England. What's also really interesting, and that's not to say these, th th there aren't elements of you know, issues between different parts of the UK. That exists in anywhere where you've got a, um, you've got a bigger country and a smaller country. You know, Canadians don't need me to tell, about, tell you about that kind of dynamic. There is a dynamic there. Um, but I think the way that countries see themselves, and Ireland's really interesting on this, the evolution. If you look at the evolution of Ireland, and actually Ireland now has the best relationship with its neighbour um, to its east than it has done in 800 years, you know, um, in part because of they joined the EU in the same day. So you, you have that evolution. What's also interesting in Scotland is, to go back one, you know, People who are in favour of independence will tell you it is not worth one bloody nose. This is a question, a discussion and debate about what is the best way to deliver good governance for the people who live there. Now, some people think that's remaining in the union. That's fine. Some people believe that's being part of, you know, that's independence. That's fine too. But as one commentator put it, it's quite boring because it's, it's a, which in a good way, you know, boring politics is good politics. Um, you don't want to be overexciting politics. Um, boring politics is good politics. So, I, I don't think you've got that on the Margaret Thatcher stuff. Look, people in Scotland haven't voted for the Conservatives since 1955. So what what you'll you know you need to be 89 years old to have voted for the Conservative Party when they won in Scotland. You know, so what you'll find is that what I think others will disagree is you're seeing that divergence in public opinion. That's related in Europe. It's related in some of the issues that Claire highlighted. It is related in migration. You know, UKIP. You know, in some ways, we went into that Brexit referendum because of the Conservatives being over UKIP. So UKIP were a party that, that, that rose in favour of leaving the EU. They never saved a parliamentary deposit in an election in Scotland. To get a parliamentary deposit back, you need 5% of the vote. So I never found it was there. 62% to remain at, at the time. Now, member, um, support for the EU has increased a, across Europe as a result of Brexit. But in Scotland, you know, 62% most cut member states at that time pre-Brexit would have bitten your hand off for 62%. And what's also interesting, sorry, there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here, is I'm not entirely convinced around, you know, let's talk about identity for a moment. I'm not convinced that's the way you should think about your politics, but, but let's talk about identity. The Social Attitude Survey found recently that in 2010, 44% of the population um, thought themselves as Scottish not British, 7% of themselves thought of themselves as being more British than Scottish or just British. Now, 10 years on, 77% of the population of Scotland believe themselves, to, you know, consider themselves to be more Scottish, not British, even if they believe, you know, the union's a good thing. 23% increased from that 7% now believe themselves to be more British than Scottish or exclusively British. What that tells you is that middle ground has disappeared in terms of that. It also tells you that if Brexit and the Conservative Party have been described by commentators elsewhere in the world as increasingly Brexit as an English nationalist project. So if you're Scottish or Welsh or Northern Irish, you're saying, well, where do we fit into that particular project? And I'm not sure that the debate accommodates that at the moment. But these are big issues that, you know, and, and I know there's a lot of people down south who really wrestle with this um, as, as well, regardless of what happens. On the other, sorry, and I've skipped over so much, but the, um, there's so much there. On the other two questions, um, on the EU, um, the EU is quite simple. Look, the Spanish, who everybody quotes, have said, you know, Partido Popular, when they were in power, and the socialists in power, have always said, if Scotland becomes independent in a referendum that's recognised by London in a legal constitutional way, nobody in Europe's going to have a problem with that. What, what they worry about is has Scotland met the Aki Communitaire, which, of course, you know, there's work to be done on institution building, but as European politicians will tell you, Western enlargement and Eastern enlargement are two entirely different things, and there is no queue. You know, Turkey joined the queue when some member states of the EU didn't even exist. There is no queue. So it's about the acquis communautaire. It's about the rules-based system. Um, that poses questions because you need to look at what, what you need to do, and I think that that raises questions of speed for accession, which is entirely not outside the Scottish government's hands, incidentally. 
um because that's you could start work on that now i think probably we need to beef up the office in brussels for instance you know limited resource but as a question you know but 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 could scotland be a of course it could i mean you're not going to deny it membership if it's met those criteria on trident um so the the U, the uk's entire nuclear deterrent sits in scotland not a bit of it the entirety so if scott let's let's hypothetically say scotland becomes independent that means that your entire nuclear deterrent would be sitting in the sovereign territory of another country now and again i'm making no comment on what you know so i think i think what what will happen is you will talk about withdrawal safely i don't think keeping it i mean this is look if you keep it then what happens if one scottish government negotiates to keep it just hypothetically and then we have elections and elections people in scotland with independence will get the government they vote for another government is swept to power because they promise to get rid of the nuclear weapons now i'm not saying if that's a good thing or a bad thing but it means that the defense the uk's entire nuclear deterrent is dependent on the electoral whims of another country now I don't think if you're a defence planner, they, these guys plan for everything. They're really smart folk in the Ministry of Defence here and elsewhere. I think you're looking for alternatives at the moment, because if that happens, because you've got, you know, even if it doesn't happen, you need to be planning. So, I, I think that they're going. I, I, I think actually independence would mean that the rest of the UK really has to reassess where it sits in the world. Have a really in terms of the EU globally nuclear weapons, but I just can't see the UK. What remains of the UK leaving its entire nuclear deterrent to the whims of the electorate of another country? Sorry, Claire. No. Sorry, Rita. There was a lot. There was a lot in those questions. There is a lot there. Yeah, it's um, yeah, is a the nuclear weapons is a very interesting. It's not just the thirty-five billion pound price tag of thinking of an alternative site. It's like twenty years to to build it. It's um. Yeah, so I think you're right. It's it's one to watch. Um, I just wanted to add something in response to Alan's question around, the, if I understand, you, you know, to what extent is Scott is um, the movement for Scottish independence motivated by an anti Englishness or a kind of no a separate. Uh, 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 I see. I see. Yes. And, and, and Braveheart. <laughs> yes, I think got you. Got you. Got you. Yes. Yes. I think it's part yeah. I think it's part of it. It's part of carving out what's distinct about Scotland, definitely. That's part of what's going on there. Because interestingly, Attitudinal surveys show that Scottish and English people have much the same views on a whole wide range of issues, but, but it translates into different voting preferences. So it's a really kind of interesting conundrum. But I think it's partly about the Scottish government carving out what's distinct about us. And that's part that's partly because they believe it will play well. So it's partly a reflection of Scottish attitudes and partly a way of building Scottish attitudes in that direction. So I think that that's right. And it's, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, I think for it's and and to what extent then does that influence what UK politicians decide to do in, in kind of in reaction to that is another interesting question and where that leaves pacifists and uh, good the good global citizens of the English population. Yeah, it's interesting. Just to clarify, I didn't, I wouldn't suggest in Scotland would keep the weapons. I'd say the conditions of their decommissioning and withdrawal would be a source of leverage and what are going to be nightmarish and difficult mm -hmm. negotiations. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, uh, all of you. Uh, I think we've come pretty much to the end. I want to say a couple of things before we get there. Uh, we've spoken a lot about nuclear weapons, and I will take the opportunity to highlight a forthcoming talk at SIPS, on, uh, which is entitled Nuclear Threat and Canada's Disarmament Diplomacy, which will take place at SIPS on the 28th of November, and it will be 
a lecture delivered by um, Paul Meyer, who's been involved in nuclear disarmament and Canadian foreign policy for a very long time. So I highly recommend that we, we've learned today many things, but one of the things we can take away is that um, the nuclear threat is, is firmly back on the agenda of global politics. I will also highlight, uh, as I did in the beginning, we have another SIPS talk today uh, on feminist foreign policy, Scottish perspectives, Canadian perspectives with Rebecca Thiessen and, and a number of other scholars will be present. That is in this room at two o'clock. So you have a, a brief break and then we can go again. And with that, I will just uh, thank uh, Peter, Claire and Gethin for uh, a wonderful, uh, Stephen Gethin for a wonderful uh, instructive talk. I've learned so much and, and uh, we will follow the good global citizen as you go forward. Uh, and perhaps in not too long, we will have you all back to take stock of where we are. So please join me in thanking the Scottish on Council.